that's what we're doing here. So here's the old joke <laughs> that half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. It's not a joke that it's still the case that your average homeowner has the same problem with his space heating bill or hers. Half, from our experience, roughly half what people are spending on their space heating is quite unnecessary. So people complain about their energy bills, they could halve them at a stroke. Allow me to sell you a dozen of these. Um, so uh, many of you will have these things in your house. Thermostatic radiator valves, that's what the TRVs stand for. Mechanical ones, really nice idea. They save lots of energy because rather than trying to balance your radiators mechanically, um, to get about the right amount of heat in each room. You set something which is a temperature roughly and it maintains the room at that temperature, which is excellent. In fact, it's such a good simple idea and these things are so cheap that it's actually mandatory in all the different UK building codes to have um, thermostatic radiator valves. You have to have them. But it's a bit of a trenchy system in the sense that we, we have very poor housing stock which loses lots of heat. And the way it works is you put a thermostat in the coldest bit of your house, or if you're building a new house, you have two zones, but you have two thermostats in the coldest bit of the house, which switch your boiler on if any of the rooms might need heat, which means at the least you're running a circulation pump all the time when you don't need to, to allow these to let the hot water in when you actually do need heat in a room. So the solution to that is a slightly smarter one. Here was the one you got up there, that was our revision one, this is revision two. Um, you replace this thing with something a bit smarter. Um, and the key change here, the zoning change, is that each one of those emits a little signal saying, oh, we need heat in this room. And if any one of those, but only if any one of those is asking for heat, does the boiler come on? That's simple. I mean, you know, any commercial building of any size at all is zoned. No one would, well, mind you, I went into a local authority where they do have one thing set in the whole building, which means everything's baking. Um, and I complained twice to the sustainability person they're thinking about maybe getting around to thinking about a, a committee. But anyway, any sensible uh, building is already zoned. So you can do it for your own house. And so our little thing is you have one of these controlling heat radiator. I can give you details later. Uh, if anyone's interested, we'll have a workshop tomorrow in where you can build one of our units if you want to. Um, where, where you only run the boiler if you actually need it, and the other thing is to only run it in the rooms where you need it. Most people in this country, 60% of all <coughs> your energy bill goes towards space heating, and most people admit to leaving heating on in rooms where there's no one there. And, and actually, we claim you can save about 50%, and we've actually borne this out with the, we've had some trials smaller I'd like, but there's some dramatic graphs which I can show people afterwards which you see someone puts in us, so here's the graph of actual heat requirement because of temperature, and his gas demand was fitting right up underneath this, he installed our system, doom, half. Took it out, because I managed to blow up his boiler, we won't talk about that bit. Back up. <laughs> back up to get the top. You know that thing about accepting criticism, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he puts it back in and doom, down again, half like this. I sent that to the chief services and said, I haven't got you the numbers yet, but look at that and tell me this isn't worth happening. Okay, and the aim is that this will cost you a tenner a radiator. Okay, so we're talking really cheap, a whole house for 100 quid. There's 17 billion pounds a year, I think, um, spent on space heating in the UK. We can save six billion a year if everyone puts one of these in their house. There we go. In fact, look, I even got my numbers right. And more pertinently, because I'm after saving the planet, 20% of all the UK's carbon emissions are space heating, space heating homes. We could knock 10% off the entire UK's carbon emissions if everyone had one of these. And in, uh, the number's very similar for the whole of Europe. It's, it, you know, the saving would be 8% of the whole of Europe. Uh, and because we're being funded by a, uh, uh, we've had some funding from a European oriented body, we now talk about the EU, not just the UK. What we don't expect is people to program them. We don't expect people to get plumbers and electricians in. We don't expect people to reconfigure their entire heating system. So whatever it is that we're going to do that's going to get wide adoption has to be retrofit. In other words, you've got to be able to knit down Maplands or B&Q by a shrink wrap box with a bunch of these things and install it yourself. And that's what our technology allows. And just to be clear, we're right at the end of this press in a way, while I've still got the day job, we are hoping within two months to actually have the fully production engineered and ready. So we've got working prototypes, but some of these at this moment in Norwich slaving over a hot computer, um, getting things like, so we've got 3D printed boxes here, but they're doing proper injection molded boxes and stuff for us. 
Um, so, you know, 20 million homes, you can work out the numbers, but anyway, here's this big number, we could halve that. So all this um, complaining about energy bills being too high, right. Most people don't heat, heat empty rooms. So what we're aiming for, really, ideally, it's been pointed out, that what you don't want to do is heat the house, you want to keep the people warm in it. Right, you don't want your clothes to rot or get, you know, uh, mildew on them. But apart from that, really, you want a cosy, warm bubble of heat that's following you around. And there are some very fancy solutions now, like infrared lasers that actually target you and keep you warm. Well, we're not quite that clever. <laughs> <laughs> not for a tenor of room, we're not. So, what do you think? Well, this is a rocket science thing. Uh, so, this is a rocket science. And indeed, because our aim is to get maximum adoption, we are well, we're possibly mad. Our aim is to give everything away. So all our stuff is published under Apache license, or thank you, Andrew, uh, a solar pad, for example, for the hardware. Um, even the box design is, is given away. Because what we're hoping is that someone in China will attempt to, in quotes, rip us off by making hundreds and thousands of these things far cheaper than we possibly could. And indeed, the people like Honeywell and Eatmiser and so on will say, oh, yes, our thing is open TRV compatible, which means you can then safely go and buy anything which have an open TRV stamp in the same way that if you buy something with a Wi-Fi stamp on it, you know it's going to work. Um, I had a fascinating, we, we open TRV won a competition, well, it, it came third competition, but it won a prize from British Gas called Connecting Homes. And we went to check them afterwards, and their system hive, the radio alone in their uh, radiator control units cost more than our entire uh, controller. And so we said, well, you know, we could, we could bridge our stuff onto yours, and it'd be much cheaper, and we could give you the stamp of compatibility. You know. So here I am, a, you know, one person, one or two person entity with, a, with an open source project, go to British Gas and say, we could give you a stamp of authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> and they were really keen. It was just amazing. But, you know, those are quite powerful, uh, positive messages for consumers as well, that they won't have to check it all out next year. Um, so what are we doing? Zoning, I've, I've described a bit. The point is that heat each room on its own merits. Um, occupancy sensing. So this does a simple thing. Lots of people, I mean, so for our kids, I used to go upstairs half an hour before they were there, <coughs> turn up the TRV, then I had to fiddle with the heating to make sure it came on, let their rooms get warm and then turn it down when we went upstairs again. Well, most people in the UK will simply not spend that much effort on their heating. I think it's fairly clear. Um, so there are a couple of approaches to that. This thing has two little buttons on the side. You can set a program. So what would happen without setting any, having any flashing 12 zero zeros on here? Um, for my kids, I'd go up half an hour if they want, they want to go to bed at the normal time. I press this button, and it remembers and will bring the thing on for an hour then every 24 hours thereafter. Now, I think many people would allow that level of interaction. It's a button you press once, and that's the end of it. The other thing is that if it detects you're not in the room, and it's pretty crude at the moment, it's just ambient light, so if it's too dark for you possibly to be doing anything other than sleeping, it drops the target temperature by a degree. So even if you don't turn it off, it'll still save you 8 to 10% of your eating. Now, I, you know, there are people like me who are obsessive and will go and press buttons and turn things off, on and off. I want to make it simple for people who don't care to nonetheless realise those savings. Um, and then the, the sort of things which Nest and the other poster channels do is they try and learn about when you're going to be in the house and turn heating on before you go home. There's 30 lines of code in here which is turned off at the moment, which does much of that. So I keep stats about what sort of times of the day that you tend to have heating on and so on. But actually, that's, that's secondary. The, the big problem with Nest is it's still trying to do this job from one point in your house, not actually in the rooms you're in. We can do a lot better because we know which room you're in. Um, cheap. This is important. If people are going to put it in, it's got to be cheap. Honeywell now does. So, at that meeting, the workshop, the smart heating workshop, the Honeywell man was there and promised me stuff, and I think he realised when he got out of the meeting, oh, we don't actually have it. And strangely enough, in a year, there was a product. But their product costs 70 quid per radiator, which means your payback, if you get one at all, will be several years. The aim of ours is to get it cheap enough that you get payback with a single, single heating system this season. So if you're a householder in the UK and you want to save some money, you can go and buy this stuff from B&Q, and whatever, install it yourself, and by the end of the winter, you will have saved money overall. Now, I think that's a, that's a value proposition, I think we would say, um, that's obvious 
to most people. Now, actually, so this is all free and open source. How are we supporting it by having a commercial? We're going to make the same proposition to hoteliers for each of their rooms. We'll charge you, we won't even sell you this, we'll rent you this for a year. And if it doesn't save you money on your heating by controlling each room individually and some other nice stuff, um, we'll give you your money back and we'll take stuff away. I think it's such an obvious uh, win that. This has got to be simple enough that you don't need a smartphone. I mean, lots of people do want to control stuff from their smartphone, but lots of people don't. I asked my other half, I said, look, we've got tablets in the house, I've got a server, I can, you could control it all from your Android tablet, and she absolutely refused to contemplate <laughs> fiddling with heating, quite rightly, um, from a computer when she'd go and press the button on the thing. And so there's certainly going to be groups of people who want the buttons on the things, we're putting this in social housing, they're not necessarily going to have internet connection and so on. So we want to make it simple, that makes it cheap, but we will have internet connectivity on the back end. And look, here is our key thing that we are trying to do, we're being open source because we're hoping that lots of people will become compatible with us or we can be compatible with them. So you've seen it, it's easy enough that a four-year-old can operate it and test it on a four-year-old um, and my eight-year-old. Uh, and the aim is that this is going to be a mass, mass market cheap product. So I'll let you guess which of those is me. <laughs> So um, this is an open source project with maybe six people involved, of whom there are really two really key people, um, other than us two. One is the radio engineer who reverse engineered one of the protocols with GNU radio so that we can use it, and the other chap who's done all our PCB design, absolutely nutter in Denmark, um, and, and wonderful. Uh, and then there's us two, and we have now, uh, we have this terrible thing, we had to accept uh, tens of thousands of, of euros of, of funding from the EU. It was horrible. <laughs> so we had to set our company to receive the cheque. So we are co-director of OpenTRV Limited, and Mark does all the hard work, chasing money and doing all the admin, and I just sit here playing with technology. It's great. I seem to have achieved my hobby state, so I don't think that can last much longer. But we have been talking to people like, you know, Sandy, the Secretary of State for Energy, is my local MP, and I have his own email address, and his chief scientist and his chief engineer, and these people who make most of the TRVs in the country, these people who make lots of boilers, and Dale Vince is a lovely chap, and we are, we are, we're we not quite sure yet whether this October we'll be able to actually sell our productionized units by him, but it's likely, and we've been working to do trials and other stuff with, with universities. We want some money off these people. These people force us to accept a check, it was terrible. And we've had, and we've had practice in the past, so, uh, I was one of the very first internet service providers in the country, and I didn't get into it to make money. I got in it to disrupt a very ugly duopoly, and six months after I did so, there were 50 ISPs. So you can definitely, you know, had experience doing this before, and I paid off my mortgage with selling a small amount of shares in this one. So when we're talking to, this is from our pitch slide to investors, is to say we've done this before, we're a relatively safe pair of hands in terms of running a business to support the open source project. So what's our unique selling point from a commercial point of view? Well, this fast payback thing, this isn't a multi-year payback. I think New York City has a rule with um, buildings that if there is a measure you can take that will pay back within any years, you are obliged to do it. Okay? So think about this, if I say this will pay back within a single heating season, even, even the most narrow-minded bean counters should say, oh, oh, that's within one budget period, oh, that's not a good idea. What we're not trying to do is sell hardware. So this whole thing about what you do with your, you know, your prize idea or who do you ask about it. This is, in a sense, easy, although we might be mad, it might not be possible. We're trying, in a sense, to do the Red Hat model. We're not selling the underlying thing, we're giving it away. So we're making a reference version and we're giving it away. What we're trying to do is sell you is the sizzle, which is the, the, the new development, um, support, if you're British Gas and you do decide you'd like to be open to you can well, you write us a nice check and we will develop the thing which interfaces nicely with your current product or whatever. And, I have to say this because it's fashionable, but also because we're in a competition to get money from the technology strategy board for it. Um, if, if, I can, um, I'll, if I can manage to operate my computer correctly in a moment, I will show you a real bit of IoT. But as it happens, we discover ourselves in the interesting. I spend all my time writing expensive software for big institutions. Okay, I spent 20 years building stuff in banks that's been kind of bleeding edge. 
Uh, you may have heard of one of my uh, clients called Lehman Brothers, for example. Um, no, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> um, um, I did have professional indemnity insurance, so I really hope it wasn't my fault. Um, but what we built is these things, so I'm using a bunch of these at home, obviously, and eating my own dog food, as they would say. And they've got a couple of sensors in them, so they've clearly got temperature sensors in, but they've got a light sensor and other stuff. And as it happens, we now have a super reliable, low cost, that uses microwatts sensor network. So the sort of stuff you were talking about, we've got a working microwatt powered, it'll run for a couple of years off two AA cells, for example, and uh, can be heard 300 meters away, it's using ISN. So uh, we're talking to a chap we know, how much should I say? <laughs> we're trying to persuade TFL that what they really want to do, the Transport for London, is they really want one of our units in every bus shelter. Collecting air quality data, for example. Uh, giving it away. Open source software, open source hardware. Thank you, Ben Andrew. And uh, Chuck is not here for putting over the solar pad license. <laughs> so when you're giving away hardware, it's not like giving a design, it's not like giving away software. Software is copyright, it's the key thing, and not patenting it. Indeed, the reason why we're doing a patch is that if anyone tries to use our stuff and then sue us over some random patent, they lose the license to use our stuff. So it's purely a patch rather than say, BSD or public domain to avoid that angle of the <coughs> solar pad and even the 3D box design. It's Apache. Current state, we've had multiple revisions. We're going into production engineering now. We've got microcontrol software, documentation, mailing lists, IRC, <coughs> websites, 3D box design. Lots of things done. And hopefully, it'll be a real product this year, this revision. Uh, how do we get our box done? Thames Valley Rep Rep user groups, great. We say, can we have 40 of these made or 60 of them? Your thing's going to go off. Do I need to stop or should I carry on? Right. Thanks. Right. Okay. Um, and it's great. It's a distributed system. So we send them out the box design and they send me back a print. And if it works, we say, please make any more. And if it doesn't, we say, could you can recalibrate your printer? Work really well. And these things turn up randomly in the post in a trickle. Um, so that's, you know, where this thing comes from. It's some random printer from a person I never met. Oh, and you notice that with the child labour, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of our designs being assembled by a small child, but we won't discuss that. Um, so our experience is all positive. I'm, uh, I'm inclined to be a kind of, I'm an engineer who sees where the floors are going to be and what's going to break and who's going to break in and so on. So an engineering point of view, I'm a glass half empty guy. But the experience with this has been pretty well entirely positive. People have been really helpful, they've thrown money at it, people have been other than, I guess if I melt Nigel Lawson, he might be a bit down on it because I'm trying to save the planet for a problem he doesn't think exists. But it's been great, you know, we've had people contact us from all over the place, all over the EU, for example, or join in and actually help us for free. Uh, we won some, we, oh, it's lovely winning a prize, it sort of makes you feel good. We've had some funding already and there's more on its way. Um, we've been talking to a couple of energy retailers, big and small, green and non-green. Um, we've had very positive interactions with academics and, you know, even with the Department of Energy. Uh, I think this is a lovely story. So I met the chief scientist and he took me into his office, which is a tiny pokey thing, and, um, and he offered me his own Lapsang Souchon stash, which he'd got. Uh, he didn't like drinking the office tea, so he had his own stash of tea bags and made it for me. Lovely chap. Went to meet the chief engineer and he bought me a beer. So, tell me that's not the difference between science and engineering. <laughs> um, so, the future. So, we are expecting to have, we are trying very hard to have a production engineered stamp, which if we get the final bit done, we'll have a CE stamp when we can retail it. But if not, uh, it'll be going into collaborating with another company to do stuff in social housing um, and various other applications. We continue to do trials. It's exactly the thing. Does it do what it says on the tin? I didn't get enough trials to commit myself either way, but if I find it doesn't work, I'll spend my time on something else. You know, I'm sure there are other ways I can save the planet if it turns out I've been barking up the wrong tree. This thing, IoT, turns out we've got a really good platform. Um, we haven't done this yet. We need to get security. Almost nobody does any of this has any sensible security on this at all. I said almost no. <laughs> Yeah, well, please give us all your technology and then we'll solve that. You can um, solve it on now. Right, <laughs> um, We've got hobbyist kits. We want to keep the open source element going. So I've got in the room there, I've got uh, 20 kits and I've got 
um, some made up boards as well as someone wants to buy made up boards for tinkering with, you're welcome. Um, some of the cost, and we're always willing to take other people's hard work for free. <laughs> um, that's us, and I'm just here and get you this final thing. If I, can work out to do it. I think while you're doing that, you go on, please, we, will, we will have a question and then. Yeah. Oh, we've got a lot of questions. Oh, go on. Now, where do we start? Let's start, start asking there. questions. Um, I don't know if I missed a bit, but what's actually attached to the radiator? Oh, don't get picky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, as a politician would say, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you'll answer it. Ah, oh, <laughs> this is why I'm not a politician. Um, so what we did in the first instance, remember I told you a chap that reverse engineered something for us. So he reverse engineered this thing called the FS20 protocol. Oh, yes. And there's a bunch of stuff, these valves that you can buy off the shelf from Conrad. So these units that I waved around at you here control this. There are going to be two forms of this. One where you have a split unit like this, where something on the valve is just done on the valve, on the valve itself. And a smart thing you're holding around. And that's nice, because if your stuff's down the back of a sofa or something, you don't necessarily want to fiddle around with it. <coughs> but having two units is going to be more expensive than one. The thing we are trying to get production engineered right now has the mechanics in it as well. And none of us are particularly mechanical, so we need a brain to help us with that. And that will come out of the uh, product engineering. Just Does that mean uh, with the recent aqua um, mess acquired by Google, does that mean Google actually hates you? No, um, Google keeps trying to hire me, and I keep having to say, you don't hire freelancers, go away. No. I've had to threaten the legal department to stop har harassing me. Um, no, so the, the problem with Nest, as I said, is that it's, it's working on the broken model, which is trying to regulate your entire house well from a single point, which is not where anyone is actually sitting. So it's very pretty, and it's <coughs> lovely design values, and as you can tell from my box, I wouldn't know because I did a bit in the ass. Um, Beautiful, uh, but to my mind, solving the wrong problem. Um, now, I'm very happy for Google to find us out, and I will set a price no higher than a couple of billion. That <laughs> <laughs> also totally ex uh, excels in the art of single zone, because it doesn't even handle water. Oh, well, we they don't handle water, yeah, don't talk water. about that bit. Uh, <laughs> most people, you know, most, most of these boilers, system boilers around the UK, which is the most common model, uh, most common kind of install uh, require a separate control of water, which the Nest doesn't do. So I don't know what they're asking. I think they're waiting to, to come up with a UK model that, that really does the UK market. All right, well, excuse my competence. Here is data actually being streamed. It will count as live, but, and I'm sorry that some of you will recognize this as GNU plot in here. We won't talk about that either. But this is temperature data from all the different things in all the different things in my house controlling valves. <coughs> so look, we've got my OT. Can we have a large check, please? So you know, it does actually work. And I've taken, I don't know how many samples it is, but I haven't actually had wrote my own protocols on top because there aren't enough protocols in the world and so on at the raw bit level. And I haven't, as far as I can see, had a single error in hundreds of thousands of readings either. The thing has worked fantastically well, which is why I said, well, we maybe ought to claim that we know how to do this. Yeah, one there. Oh, that, yeah. So, I just want to add next to, I don't know if you've seen the latest initiative, the, the thread network being uh, stacked and everything, which is a low power wire standard and stack for the home. I suggest they're doing a little more than I've ever seen. No, no, there's loads of good things going on, and Apple are doing their home <coughs> and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, do you, do you plan to buy into any of those standards? Uh, anything's open. I mean, what we really want to be is interoperable with other people and have other people be interoperable with us. And I'm utterly agnostic how we get there. I'm writing for this registered article. I said, look, there's, there's two things. Do you want to make X happen, in this case, income, or do you want to get the glory for doing it? I am not after the second one of those. I don't care how we get there, as long as it doesn't lock us into something which stops other people using it freely. Well, we've got so many questions. Mm. Uh, this gentleman. Okay. Um, you were talking about how crude uh, the control, the fundamental control of um, gas central heating is in most houses today. Um, I've actually got uh, electric storage heaters still, which is perhaps an order of magnitude more crude. Um, these things heat up when the uh, power companies decide the electricity is cheap, 
uh, they let the energy out at some rate governed by a mechanical device which doesn't even have a timer on it. Have you thought about looking at uh, electric storage heat? Well, at the moment, the focus of this is on fairly quick response, um, so gas-fired radiators, but that's a huge fraction of the UK mm -hmm. and across Europe as well. Now, actually, there's an intermediate stage for yours, which, in effect, which is um, heat pump stuff, mm -hmm. where you can't just turn it on and expect the house to be warm in a quarter of an hour. Um, and actually, the first deployment of energy is <coughs> was actually controlling someone's hot water run by district heating in Denmark. Um, and we made it work for that. Now, that is not what this is focused on. If you're trying to do too many things that won't work, you should talk to a bunch of guys called Thermionics, you know, mm -hmm. who are exactly working on your problems. They've got nice scheduling algorithms, and they've got a better control on the mechanics and so on. Oh, cool, right. um, if you can't find it, look it up afterwards. Come to me, and I'll find it. I've got yeah. mails in my mailbox, because they want to do some work with us. So we're not tackling that problem yet. We're talking about very immediate, relatively low thermal mass yeah. houses. But yeah, love to solve that. Thermionics. Right. <coughs> yeah, could I just clarify a point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your device controls that Conrad actuator, is that it? And talks to the boiler. Right. So there's the two things. I mean, really, this is not rocket science. It's really, really, really not. How does it talk to the boiler? So actually, the one that sits at the boiler can also control its own valve, but just sits there listening all the time, and it eavesdrops on the conversation between the controller and the valve. And if it asks, hears any of the valves being asked to be more than 0% open, it switches the boiler off. That's got a relay in it. Uh, actually, so there's a separate box you put on the side with exactly with a relay in it.